Welcome everyone to this talk by Desert Humanities at Arizona State University, part of the Institute for Humanities Research. And uh, we have future events that you can see on our website. I've put the link in the chat, uh, including Vicki Kirby and in conversation with Karen Broad at the end of the month. But today we're going to be talking about uh, deserts, AI, phenomenology, and uh, human and non-human interactions, thanks to Lisa Moravec. And uh, I'll introduce Lisa, who will then uh, provide a presentation, and there will be opportunities for question after answer after the talk. Um, and also, if you have questions during the chat, uh, during the talk, just put them in the chat and we can address them uh, at the Q&A. So Lisa Morvik is an art performance historian. She's the recipient of a postdoc Ernst Mach research grant working on feminist exchanges between Austrian and British performance oh. artists in the 1980s. Her transdisciplinary PhD thesis, Dressage Animality, Human and Animal Actors in Contemporary Art, worked through ethical and aesthetic questions in regards to social dressage and bodily animality, in a selection of American, British, and European case studies from the 1960s. Morva currently transforms the PhD into a book and prepares her next book project, on performance models, which examines cybernetic technologies, digital images, and live bodies and artistic practices from the last 20 years. She recently edited the special issue, Humanism After the Human of Photography and Culture and platform issue, Balancing Act, focused on dance performance. She supervises BA dissertations at Kingston School of Art, teaches aesthetics philosophy at Royal Holloway, University of London, and contemporary performance at the University of Vienna. Her public writing has appeared in Dance Chronicle, Contemporary Theater Review, Burlington Contemporary, Text und zur Kunst, and in the exhibition catalog, Joseph Boys, which was published in concert with the Critical Boys retrospective presented at the Belvedere 21 in Vienna. So it's a pleasure, Lisa, to have you here, at least virtually, and thank you for uh, presenting today. Thank you very much, Ron, for the introduction. Um, and, and I'm very, very happy to be here, despite being extremely disembodied, as I have to say. Um, my talk here um, today is entitled Trevor Paglin's Non-Performances, uh, From Landscape Photography to Training Humans, Not Machines. Um, thank you, Ron, for inviting me to test out some of my ideas for this new um, postdoc project. And um, thank you for, for joining um, the talk as well. And I'm, I'm very um, upset that I'm not physically in Phoenix uh, right now um, because I was very much looking forward to the live conversations. Um, but I guess what uh, digitalization is, is also showing that um, there might be potentials for other ways of working. And, me being virtually present here today has not has just saved a British Airways a plane ticket, but my action of but my action of course did not stop the whole plane from then actually flying um, from Vienna to the US. Um, so today um, I'm going to introduce um, one of the case studies that I've been looking at um, while um, working on this project, and it's, it's it looks more at Ropagnin's recent work. Paglin is, um, as probably most of you know here, um, kind of a superstar in the art world who has lot, 
that's fine, who um, had large exhibitions in the US um, and has had his work shown um, in many different places and different exhibition contexts, um, and who has also um, published extensively. Um, and he just, yeah, to very briefly for the ones who probably don't know him, um, he has a PhD in geography from Berkeley and um, has also published articles. Um, Trevor Paklin um, is a US citizen and also um, has a studio in Berlin. Um, yeah, I don't want to introduce him to more extent here um, because a lot has actually already said about him, uh, especially uh, with relations. Instead, um, I'm taking the documentary Unseen Skies from 2021 as a starting point to think more about ideas of non-performing. I developed um, this concept currently as part of the project and I explore key critical ideas and developments of AI technologies and embodiment in a selection of performative artistic practices from the last 20 years that critically engage with computational and robotic technologies and asks about and we questions the notion of what the ecological um, could mean. Although these works that I'm looking at, such as Packlands, are embedded within and exhibited within the structures of contemporary capitalism, or to use the term of our neoliberal economy, I'm interested in questioning to what extent such performances, artistic performances, can help us to work through what the German sociologist Rahel Yegi refers to a crisis critique of forms of life. Hence, the crux is the question, how can we continue to imagine more ecological possibilities because of and with the application of new technologies um, rather than focusing on the operations and mainly the critique of technologically driven economic operations. In this talk, I'm discussing modes of performing and not performing to trace questions of how human agency can be represented in an economically reduced way, rather being passive or invisible, and yet at the same time actively socially engaged, ideally, as an argument to draw attention to forms of social exploitation and discrimination. And I hope that my talk will, will offer or address some of the ideas of the following question. If performances, here I mean artistic work or human labor practices are always equivocal as the output within the capitalist system, what kind of sustainable modes of performance can the concept that I'm proposing of non-performance facilitate? Um, yeah, so, and then to come back, to the documentary Unseen um, Skies. I don't know how many of you have seen it. Um, we can, we also have the links that we can, um, it's, it's available um, for, for you later, which um, the Desert Humanity Center was um, so kindly um, purchasing. And it's, a, it's an extremely um, rich documentary that covers um, a lot of the work and the images that Trevor Patkin has produced and um, he talks about his work. And it was, as a background information, it was made by the same filmmaker, Laura Pointras, who also made Citizen Four about Edward Snowden. And I'm just going to briefly, um, just going to share my screen now um, to show you a very short, um, part at, of the beginning of the document. Um, okay, so I have to go back and share my screen and open. Okay, so you should see my. I guess when I look at my own life, I guess I just 
have had experiences of living with a system that didn't work for me, you know, and that um, I guess made clear to me that there's always winners and losers and that any kind of power is always exerted at the expense of somebody else. I've been always suspicious of power and have always questioned that. This road is called the Extraterrestrial Highway because people see UFOs here all the time, which is kind of ironic that this is like this whole part of the country is about secret flight testing. People see UFOs and then <laughs> conclude that there's aliens. I started coming out to Nevada pretty regularly starting about 2002. So at that time, it was the beginning of this war on terror, and, and it was very clear that a kind of global secret infrastructure for warfare was taking hold around the world. And it turned out that a lot of the origins of that come back to Nevada in projects like nuclear weapons and experimental flight tests and kind of building secret air bases in the desert. And so it was going around and photographing those kind of places, thinking about those Cold War legacies and how they transformed and are still very much with us. What I want out of art is things that help us learn how to see the historical moment that it's really just how to look. What does it mean to be looking at the sky in the 21st century and Lo and behold, it's inhabited by things like reconnaissance satellites and space junk and bits of human infrastructure. Okay, um, just starting here. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, this was really just a part of the induction. Um, introduces his previous work um, he did in the desert um, and to trace surveillance. Um, um, sorry, this window just opened. Okay. Um, so the surveillance mechanisms in the States, um, it, it has an official budget of around, which is called the black budget of about $50 billion annually. Um, so um, this is um, really something to to keep in mind um, where he's coming from. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, I just lost my page. Okay. Um, so yeah, the and this leads me to um, the next slide. Um, which is the or orbital reflector project that um, he did in in 2015 that started. So we're leaving all, um, all of the surveillance work behind that um, Paglin produced um, and worked on before. Um, the orbital reflector project um, was a collaboration with Nevada Art Museum. It was, and the museum um, commissioned him to do this work together with him and they fundraise that you can as you can see um, on the slide um, 
money um, to be able to do this around 70, uh, $76,000 um, from 575 supporters um, on Kickstarters um, to contribute to, um, to, to the realization of the project. The reflector itself that was um, produced was a small U3 satellite, a cube satellite um, aboard of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. So the idea was to produce um, this rocket of which they had prototypes. You can see a, a, a short, um, a small image, sorry, on the left, this rounded that, which is now installed inside the museum, which is a prototype. Um, Yes, and then um, I'm going to um, to summarize a little bit what he says in the documentary when he's asked to um, to to talk about it, and he basically um, says that it has no um, no direct function, um, and it it was really a project that um, was intended to to show that a satellite can also be. Um, rather than being uh, of a military purpose, also um, have a, a non-commercial function um, to really have it um, as an alternative approach to, to measuring the sky, um, to, to, yeah, and, and looking down the earth. Um, so because the project in the end um, failed when it was set into sky, um nothing happened um it didn't arrive they lost they lost the connection to it so Pagan's artistic gesture um failed one could say failed um and today but however the, today the prototype is exhibited in a museum what is also interesting is that despite not having an actual performance so the satellites did not perform in that sense um the reflector um, it did, however, for the museum, generate about 12 million um, publicity on the media for the museum and the state of Nevada, which, was what, which is what the director points out. Um, so this, it's this two-sidedness of um, the concept of um, non-performance that the, reactor really, the reflector really brings together. <clears throat> the actual act of performing performing the action, um, but then the performance is not as effective as it should be. So this um, breaking point in Pacman's work, moving first that hit the main core of his work um, is making the invisible visible. He himself also referred to that at the beginning. Um, this is interesting. Um, to me, because the non-performative is not is nonetheless a highly performative idea of a performance, um, something that is there, but maybe you can't see it. In the regard to his early work, Trevor notes that he um, shoots landscapes, for example, which you see in the documentary, um, inspired by earlier modern scientific documentary experiments with photography. Um, the commentary about the framing of landscape um, is interesting in that regard because it has transformed throughout his work. Um, for example, Sarah Cook notes about Trevor's, uh, Trevor Paglin's work that rather than saying he is he is making the invisible visible, is that he enables us to question what invisibility looks like or to put it um, into the um, performance model that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm suggesting, what a performance could look like. I'm of course also critical of how um, Paglin is framing his own work theoretically and historically. So even with using the documentary, um, I'm working with pre-filtered material. This is very obvious um, and Trevor, um, Paglin has theoretically and historically and scientifically also shaped um, and created work. Um, for example, you could say his artistic research also directly alludes to ways of seeing as a direct reference to John Berg Berger. So again, I'm picking up um, nonetheless on the notion of landscape and he, his use of the appropriation of landscape because I think it's very productive to think with. 
and it seems to be the driving force of his later project. At the Barbican show, um, from Apple to An Anomaly, um, which opened in September 2019, um, before the pandemic, notably, um, this the the um, the it's it's really an accumulation of questioning categorizations and surveillance, but from a techno from a different technological point of view, from the means of um, capitalist production, um, serves a liberal economy. Um, we have the next slide here. That's it. Um, so this is what what it what it looked like um, at the Barbican. It was commissioned by the Barbican Curve. It's round shape, and um, there was an accumulation of images um, that draws from um, ImageNet. It's uh, it's a white, it's the most commonly used um, image um, image um, a database that is used, um, which developed an algorithm. And in the, in Paglen show. Um, it brought together around 30,000 individually printed photographs um, that were grouped together um, according to categories that are also used by, um, by the company. So we have another slide. For example, pest, um, as you can see here. So there are many different um, images that come together, different sorts of of other categories that are then brought together. Um, just very briefely, um, for ImageNet is, um, is, a, is a project based at Stanford University, which extracts and um, harvests images from, from online capitalist platforms, um, which people also upload right on the internet. Um, so it's this um, kind of circular um, mechanism that is in, in place here. Um, and its aim is yeah, to categorize. Um, this reminds me very much of um, Abby Warburg's um, Wilder Atlas um, Sune from the 1920s, which groups, um, obviously, visual images, um, art images together across different periods to, to, um, for, the, for the sake of periodization. Such classifying systems produce meaning and put representations through implicit value statements um, into action. <clears throat> Packland's work exposes um, the working method of AI companies and their socially discriminating mechanisms thereby. Um, yeah, so we don't have another slide. Um, then the next slide, please skip. And uh, next one, yes. So, no, one back, sorry. Um, so Paglin developed his project um, together with um, Kate Crawford, um, which was called the Anatomy of AI, and it um, it really critiques um, the historical practice of, of social discriminations. As Trevor notes in an interview in the exhibition catalog of the Barbican show. Um, AI systems are produced by companies that come out of small of a small set of elite university laboratories spaces um, that in the West tend to be extremely affluent, very wide, technically oriented, and of course, predominantly male. The underlying mechanism that he describes um, are rooted here in the contemporary um, in the contemporary moment um, in the social means of digital production or digital um, a production of a digital reality. The problem with AI technologies is that they are becoming increasingly autonomous, such as um, machine algorithms produce an art image or produce um, images on the internet more widely, um, Google images, for example. When asked what, um, what we should do with technology, um, Paglin notes in an interview with Anthony Downey that you have to begin the conversation through reconceptualizing how we think about technology. Technology um, 
is always linked to an idea of, um, of technique. So what kind of cult cultural technique is applied at a given moment in time. And um, so we have another slide. Um, for, for example, after World War II, um, when scientists started to, to work more on um, calculations, so mass-based at that time, um, rather than, than rooted in, um, in, in the technique of um, AI technologies, which work with, um, with data sets and um, training an algorithm to respond um, in, a, in a very um, behavioristic um, manner. So for example, Norbert Wiener, who defined um, in, in the late 90s and 1994, the machine similar to an animal, um, reconceptualizing um, also the human thereby. Um, it, it was interested in the realization of a mathematical structure to construct a new form of reality. Also, Kate Crawford, um, Peglin's, co Peglin's um, colleague, notes about the notes about the human relationship and refers to the clever hands example. And she stresses that artificial intelligence then is an idea and infrastructure and industry, a form of exercising power. This system that she describes aims to put into place an automata, an automatized and performance um, mechanism that aims at optimization and capitalist efficiency. And this brings me back to the question of human agency per se and performance in general. The performance of human agency and how it programs machine to act and respond through machine vision that imitates human sensory perception. So the question of how a nervous system, how the human um, operates um, in comparison to other non-human objects. Norbert Wiener, um, in his book, Cybernetics, importantly speaks also of an effective tone when describing the conditioning reflex that Pablo demonstrated um, in his dog experiments. So that, um, he, he distinguishes feature and different categories. And then we have another slide. Um, and a performance that took place um, at the same time as the Barbican show, the exhibition. Uh, sorry, the next one. Um, yeah, Sight Machine. Um, it was a, a concert for um, a quartet that performed with David Harrington, um, John Serba, Hank Dude, and Sony Young. And they played um, a concert. I'm going to um, share my screen, show it. So we can see it was, um, uh, did I think I clicked on stop sharing the screen? Yes, okay. So um, we go to the next slide um, before we saw the, the concert and then the algorithm that um, Paglin um, developed together with, um, with a software engineer um, is, is adding these um, boxes with um, different classifications, um, which is rooted in facial recognition techniques. Um, and 
But these categories that are applied, um, so when they perform their face um, changes uh, and so on. So the, the categories change all the time as well, um, but they are not correct. So for example, um, there are many different mistakes that happen. For example, um, a man could then be identified as a woman, as we can see here in the top image on the right, um, and also the facial expression um, can be wrong and so on. So um, the problem that you can see is, first of all, how do we conceive? The, the algorithm um, understands that it's looking at a person, but what does it mean to classify a person in terms of its identity um, and categories? Um, Sam Brown, for example, um, has, a, has um, noted in a paper um, entitled Digital Epidemialization, the focus on identity, I'm quoting, is not only about new technologies of surveillance and governance at the border, but it is also about the neo-pastoral governing of the responsible and enterprising self. Um, so, yeah. So the question of identity um, then brings me back to Jacqueline's initial um, interest in the landscape. Um, when he talks about the appropriation of a landscape <clears throat> and how that relates to faces and a broader social ecological system, if, um, if we want to, 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 to make that move. <clears throat> the question of performance here is crucial to, to the idea of um, landscape that I'm trying to, that I'm suggesting. Um, and this is also very much implicit in, um, in Norbert Wiener's um, approach to cybernetics, where he says, we, we speak, uh, when we speak of to perform an action, there must also be a report to the nervous system, consciousness or unconsciousness. Um, it may be visual, at least in some part, but, in more gen more, but it is more generally kinesthetic. <clears throat> And he also says, the desire to produce and to study aut automata has always been expressed in terms of the living technique of the age. The thought of the very age is represented in its techniques. And this brings me to my final um, comment, which is one that um, at the same time, um, Theodor Adorno is um, a little bit later, as, as Wiener um, referred to technology, that um, the question is how we choose um, to perform with technology, but also um, that it's critical to think more about um, the production of technology in itself. <laughs> yeah, and then we have the last slide, um, which is... Um, yeah, and it shows an image of self-driving cars, which is the same software, a similar software um, that Paclin uses, um, which is um, which is being used um, for self-driving cars. Um, and on that note, I want to um, to to pose another question about the ethics um, that underline any form of performance. Um, if a machine and a body, um, if a machine and a body can perform in a non-binary way, um, that is up for that is a question. Um, to what extent can a, an artist um, produce a political statement, and to what extent can that statement then be perhaps more be than a gesture? So that was um, that was my um, talk about Trevor Patlin's um, work and um, the ideas that I've been working through, and I really hope and look forward to um, to any questions and to really just talk more about um, contemporary technology and our use of it. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you for that opportunity to hear your reflections. And uh, this is a chance for all of us to just sort of join the conversation with Lisa about this work. Really um, appreciate how thoughtful um, how thoughtful it is and how much it intersects. It, it works in relationship to your past work. 
you know, on, on bodies, performance, training, human and non-human or animal training. Um, I wanted to ask maybe just a opening question. You know, um, one of the things that interest me initially um, about some of this is um, I was telling some of the audience members much earlier before you came that, you know, the desert or when you first came is that the desert is often seen as an open space and uh, people can fill it and the military can fill it and they can occupy this openness, which is you know, not in fact open. There's, there are things there. Um, and, and Paglin seems to be highlighting this problem, this dynamic. One of the things that you're doing, and I think in your reading, your understanding, interpretation of Paglin is seeing this as questions of landscapes and the history of landscape art, right? Landscape aesthetics. So in landscape aesthetics, the framing of the transformation of land into a landscape that is a, a space with architectured meaning for the read for the viewer is a human move, right? It's an artist's move to move it from a land to a landscape. And one of the things I found really interesting about the way you pose this is to ask then, um, it's a landscape for who? That is, normally in painting, we say that it's the landscape for the human viewer, usually British white male, if you're thinking about 18th century or you know Dutch landscape, so Dutch white male and, and the museum or gallery viewer. But given this question of technology and cybernetics, given the idea of satellites that are in space as you know, skyscapes, um, the question becomes for whom is this a landscape? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um... I've been thinking a lot with um, the recent discussions about ecology um, and how um, how we're trying to um, how art is uh, is opening up a space to um, not not to form an utopic way of thinking, but to make, to to raise awareness um, to forms. And um, I'm interested in how the experience of landscape. So when we see in the documentary how how Paglin is experiencing it and how that is then reduced to an image, right? So the representation. And um, so I guess um, as a response, I, I could say the landscape. I'm I'm not only interested in as a representation, but as a lived experience and how that can then be. Um, that that's why we're, why I wanted to end on the performance example. Um, if we see. Um, the concert, the whole um, idea of having a performance of the audience sitting there, how can that be um, also thought of um, an artistic landscape or a cultural landscape? I don't know if that um, is... Yeah, a... and well, what's also interesting to me is that with the artificial intelligence reading the faces or reading the, um, the other cars, in that last image reading the course it's reading it not for humans so it's a landscape for the computer right um mm -hmm. but then you know as we know with surveillance technology that computer is for people who won't be seen mm. but will occupy the space right and so demand our performance in a certain way, right? We begin to self-regulate, to perform as good citizens because we might be on camera. Um, so I'm interested in both um, the person who is watching is a non-human and it only picks up things that it's trained or is sensitive to pick up. 
and then on the other side of that or um or a lot of um uh legal or law or law or government apparatus intervening so that the landscape becomes militarized or policed yeah um so it it's a, which is a very interesting aesthetic in itself yeah <laughs> it becomes a military aesthetic it becomes uh filled with that gaze right so we become subjects to that gaze yeah it's just something i'm I was thinking mm -hmm. about in relationship to this work you're bringing out mm. Yeah, I guess there's a lot to say about militarization or policing um, in, in, in regards to um, AI mechanisms and how they are applied and what roles company play and what role the state plays as well. If they are, um, if particular administrative um, operations can only be performed um, with, with the algorithms, with the, with the systems that they, um, that they visualize. Um, yeah. Jen, you wanted to get in on this. Yeah, and my usually human non-human is drinking from her cup next to me. So there you go, Lisa, a little, little animal action for you. Um, yeah, I just thank you for that, Lisa. It's good to see you um, and to see where your work is going these days. Um, I was really interested and maybe follows a little bit from Ron's question just about the apple to anomaly landscape of, of images at the Barbican. Cause I was, I was really struck by that. Uh, like a bunch of things disturbed me about that piece. And I just wondered if, if I could ask you to talk a little bit more, you know, maybe about the ethics of it or maybe does it, you know, like, I was wondering, like, there were so many individual people as well as the, like the pest you showed, but there are also lots of images of, of actual people. And um, I know that it was taken from, you know, images online, but I did wonder about the ethics of that and whether or not it was more of a, a comment on how, how we let ourselves um be captured in a sense really um and 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 whether we mind that or not i mean i'm also thinking a little bit about i've been working a little bit with you know vr and um the uh, virtual production and you know unreal has the meta human that you can now just download online and create an image based on these composite people i don't know if those were they were composites or if they were actual photos. But it's interesting as we move from that sense of those may have been actual photos to a place where you could just capture the, you know, many and make them into one who's not a real person, but looks really real. These metahumans look, you know, like any photograph, but they're kind of scraped from all the different images online and put together as one and you can use them because they're not real people so you can put them in your games engines and you can make you can create work with them so i'm sort of interested in this shift from the uh, uh, from this like landscape of of individuals who in that piece you know, are meant to maybe not be individual they're meant to be a landscape right so how does that change how we look at each one like i found myself going from image to image or like looking at the pest and saying you know how do i feel about this being decided for these non-human animals and insects in these pictures right but that shift is really happening right now and i and i just didn't know if you could talk a little bit about what paglin's intention was for that if you know about that piece or was this intended to be just an overall landscape where you didn't pick out the individuals? Was it a commentary? Or can you just tell me a little bit more about that? I'm just really fascinated by it and the move that it makes, mm -hmm. you know, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, I guess um, that's why I also refer to um, if, if I'm engaging with, with, with um, Paglin's own comments and his the, the theory that he's kind of giving us um, to his work as well. 
Um, so it comes out of the research project that he did with um, Kate Profit, right? So she was um, researching artificial intelligence um, and algorithmic production. Um, and that would then, I guess the, the problem that um, that, that show for me um, also posed is the instrumentization of art. He makes something visible, but then also he kind of uses the art space. So what, what does that kind of um, do it raises a visibility but as you say I also feel very uncomfortable when looking at this but in photography um, like these categorizations there's a, like having several um, images grouped together or human faces um, that's a quite common practice as well so it's um, it's also following uh, an art historical narrative um, but yeah it's it's also like pick pick the category the subcategory of pick the image within the category that you probably prefer that you would then use when you look for an image yourself. I think it's raising all these questions about your own agency in a way um, mm. as well. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, Jake, go for it. I beat it. Uh, Lisa, first of all, thank you for that that talk. It was so brilliant, insightful, and generative, and I'm going to be thinking with it for for a long time. Um, I wanted I wanted to ask uh, because Tra or Paglin's work um, has become you know even more expansively timely. I think in the last few months uh, with the Russia Ukraine war um, that it was already, um, which I wasn't sure was even possible, um, because yeah, at least in in my engagement with with uh, Paglin's production, um, you know, I've been thinking about his engagements with visualities and drones all the way back to 5,000 feet is best. Um, and, and that work, um, you know, I thought was really successful because it profoundly highlights, right, uh, what I think of as, you know, the indefensible uh, violences of uh, American drone warfare. Um, in the Middle East and South Asia. Um, and, you know, we might think of the uh, most sort of famous recent example being uh, the drone strike um, during the evacuation of Kabul um, in August where 10 civilians were killed, right? Um, which is indissociable from uh, the Gorgon-like stare that he highlights um, of these drone technologies. Um, but in terms of, and this is where I'm interested in uh, perhaps um, how your thinking has changed if it has, or if it's uh, operating sort of similarly to the way it's uh, you're thinking about Paglin um, has gone so far. Because I've just been sort of so moved over the last couple months in the ways in which we've seen sort of the flip side of drone warfare, um, particularly by in terms of the uses uh, by the Ukrainian uh, military. Um, the Bayraktar, uh, Turkish made drones, um, the switchblade drones um, that have been used uh, successfully to defend Kiev. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm interested as in how you're perhaps starting to think about um, as we're seeing drone warfare um, from a different sort of point of entry, um, how we might be thinking with uh, Paglin's critique um, of these technologies now, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, um, that is a really, really good question um, and thought um, in regards to, um, to the questions of machine vision, right? So to what extent um, they are reliable and to what extent they are used and in what context they are used. Um, um, I, I, I don't know if I, if I can respond directly because um, I have not um, made that direct connection right now um, because it's such recent events um, that it's still very um, unbelievable, right? Because um, like, what do we see and how, how the whole war is um, mediated as well? Um, so how we see it. Um, and then also how these machines see it and how they are um, actively involved as agents. Um, that's a, I think that's a really big new new thing to yeah explore. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you know this um, highlights a problem you have throughout, or a, a question you're posing throughout, which is making visible 
non-human relations that are not uh, they're not just objects so it's not just the drone or it's not just humans or it's not just cars but there are sets of relations like um uh, usually power relations um we often are now aware of capitalist relations of exchange whether it's issues of oil and energy or issues of commodity goods that are shipped from one place to another. Um, so these aren't just the objects themselves, but sets of relationships. And I think that it seems to me that his um, Haglin places himself in a place to expose these sets of relationships. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because um, I was thinking of non-performance as, for example, in the military sites here in the desert, those sites are performing something all the time and they're creating sets of relationships that we're not aware of. And our passiveness, our non-performance, or our ability to allow those spaces to exist um, creates some actualities and closes out other possibilities, right? So the possibility of the desert to be without humans or the possibility of the desert to be without the US state apparatus or the possibility of the desert to be a place that doesn't have borders so that people can cross. So in other words, our non-performance allows this performance of a different of these invisible apparatus to establish sets of relationships. Does that make sense in terms mm -hmm. of what you're discussing? Yeah, I think I think um, also with the last image with the self-driving cars or the drone vision, um, I think the question of sight, like what do we understand by sight and how humans perceive three-dimensional, the kinesthetic kind of experience of the world um, with us being self-reflective or being aware of having a body, being aware of um, how, how balanced like you can, you can move through space. Um, and that's really what machines do not have to the same extent. Um, like this nervousness in a way, they can be programmed, they can make decisions, but they don't have this, like the sensitivity is, is very different um, because they are um, not non-human or non-organic in that sense, um, regardless of what they are fed with, what kind of codes um, and how they are trained, um, which, um, yeah, makes it very questionable for, for all these people who program these machines as well. Um, and I think there is a lot of discussion that should needs really to happen between ethics and philosophy um, and um, the people who produce these technologies, but then who is financing that and what, what, what is it kind of serving? That's the main, I guess, um, problem. Yeah. Yes, it goes back to the question of for whom. So the idea of cybernetics, cybernetic, the word means steerage, right, from the Greek, to steer. So who is doing the real steering here, right? Um, you know, who are the people on the other end of that? Um, what are the kinds of decisions they're making? That's right. That, that certainly makes sense. Um, what, um, how are you seeing this work, this kind of work? In relationship to other work you've done on, say, human-animal relations or um, body movement in space, etc., how does this fit your your other interests? Hmm. Um, I think in in uh, in direct comparison to animals, I think it's a completely different world <laughs> because we are not talking about living beings in a sense, and and talk about how they are how they are performing or how they can perform, um, but really about it's it's not about this. It's about another entity that is still other than human. Um, but I would be wary of using the term non-human in um, in that sense, probably um, as well because it's really um, 
a programmed machine in a way um which non-human i guess um it it might be more more interesting to think in dialectics i guess i don't know um or the relation thinking more about the direct relation as you as you say or for Hume, right um to to shift it to that question thanks for that then lisa um if there are are there any other questions before we kind of wrap up here? Yes, Lisa. Thanks. Hi. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Hi, Lisa. Um, it, it, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, and it's nice to see you after a long time. Um, I, I just wanted to go back um, to the question of right at the end, you said um, something like how, how, to what extent can an artist produce, a, I think this is the word, a political statement. Um, that might have been slightly wrong, but um, can you just talk, explain that a little bit more? And then maybe do you have an answer or an opinion at this point? Um, about that, like where you, what kind of like your perception of that at this point, which I understand might change with the project, but at, at this point, do you have a kind of, yeah, perspective? Mm. Mm, so if I understand that correctly, um, the question of the question, the problem of art and politics, right? The entanglement? Um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, um, for me, it, it has been helpful to think about it in terms of performing. Um, so any action that we, um, that artists or um, kind of enact or whatever they produce, what kind of materials to work with, that's a performance in, in, in itself, right? And then the question how that is also presented, I guess, is really um, the key or how it is exhibited where is it exhibited so maybe to go back to to jen's um question or like irritation of seeing the um the exhibit at the barbican which which might be um which which is definitely creating a different experience of the ideas behind the project i guess so um the experience of of engaging with these images being confronted with them as this artistic statement maybe that is then put into space really installed um so yeah, I, I don't have any particular like answers to, to this um, <laughs> big um, big entanglement um, other than, than thinking about um, more about embodiment, right? And how the embodiment or the embodied experience in space um, links to these ideas um, behind it. Um, I'm also thinking particularly about Joseph Boyce here, for example. Um, how his idea of social sculpture um, has also shifted the focus from the object, from an art object to um, also to, the, to ecolo ecological questions um, and the question of performance coming out of fluxes um, as well. Um, yeah. Great, thank you for that. Um... And um, any other questions before we wrap up then? Um, Lisa, I wanna thank you for um, spending the time with us and uh, the desert is here for you. So we hope to have you out uh, in the future to see how your work progresses from here. Um, and I hope uh, the rest of you uh, can join me in thanking Lisa for this. And, um, and we look forward to you joining future Institute programming. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat>
Hi, it's just us now. I was so nervous. You could not imagine when I joined, I was like, oh my goodness, I can't. Um, I was literally shivering the whole time. You're, you're... I don't know why. Rob, Rob we're, we're still, we're still <laughs> recording. This... Oh. We'll, we'll, we'll edit that bit out. Don't worry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah.